members, we have a quorum at the appointed time. Good morning, all. Today we have six items on the agenda. The administration before the meeting has submitted ECI 2018-19-13 for circulation to members. We set out the changes to the directory establishment that is approved since 2002 and the impact to the directory establishment of the six item. May I remind members that if you have any direct or indirect pecuniary interest on today's discussion item, in accordance to the rules of procedure 83A, disclose the nature of the interest before you speak. And I urge members to take note of RP section 84 on voting where you have a direct pecuniary interest. First, item of the agenda, the judiciary. The proposed creation of four permanent judicial posts of Deputy Registrar High Court JSPS 13 in judiciary to strengthen judicial establishment at that level of court and one permanent civil service post of Principal Executive Officer PEO D1 to enhance support to the Deputy Judiciary Administrator's Operations Office of the Operations Division of the Judicial Administration with immediate effect upon approval by the Finance Committee and retention of one supernumerary civil service post of AOSGC D2 to continue providing support for the Development Office of the Development Division of the Judicial Administration for three years from 27 November 2018 or with immediate effect upon approval by the FC, whichever the later. And on July 17, have a consult the AJISB panel. And today we have um, the Ms. Emma Lau, Judicial Administrator, Ms. Erica Hui, Deputy Administrative Operations, and Ms. Patricia So, Deputy Administrative Development, and Ms. Connie Ngai Lau, Assistant Judiciary Administrator. And Sister Chairman AJLSP, Dr. Priscilla Leong, is not a member of this subcommittee and not able to make to this meeting, and therefore I shall uh, offer a recap from the Secretariat. The HLSP on the July 18, 2018 meeting have discussed this establishment proposal. The panel support the Judicial Administration to submit this proposal for the ASC consideration. The members are concerned about the excessive time of long handling cases and urge the judiciary with the additional manpower and posting to expedite the case handling. The members suggest judiciary to formulate measures to reduce the judge's workload. And some members also urge the administration to consider the number of courts in high court as sufficient to uh, enough for the deputy registrar in high court to hand for case handling. The administration has responded to members' question at the meeting. And who would ask the questions? Mr. Ray Chan. Thank you, Chairman. On paragraph 10 in the paper, in view of the eminent operation need to take forward various project initiatives in the pipeline since end of September 2017, a supernumerary PEO post has been created in the Judicial Administration to enhance director support. And in the footnote, it said that it a super Numeri post and uh, what is the, the details on the delegation of power and under delegated authority under what circumstances and the judiciary frequently employed this tactic due to even operation need 
NDP noted that upon the approval of this proposal by the subcommittee and during this transition period, it, um, the uh, supernum PEO post will then be withdrawn. So how long can this temp the uh, temporary post be created? Is it still approved? By the FC, suppose is this proposes vetoed. Can it continue to exist under this delegated authority? Who will take the question? Miss Emma Lau. And in response to Mr. Chen's question, the situation is this, and the Chief Justice assent in the end of 2017. We have frozen. A magistrate a posting and to turn it into a supernumerary PEO post as a basis of the delegated authority. So let me give you some more background. And currently, our magistrate court they have a uh, seven of those. In our establishment, there are a uh, nine and uh, chief magistrate. So in reality. The number of position occupied is seven, and two of them have not been utilized. Some one of those uh, pose, and, and another one that we have reserved, well, uh, to keep with any potential rise in workload of the West Kowloon um, Court Building, where we will uh, need a magistrate officer. And since we have an eminent operation need, Will uh, make use of a frozen magistration post in place of the supernumerary post under delegated authority. On one hand, uh, we can cope with the needs, operation needs of the judiciary. On the other hand, it would not affect our operations. So, uh, so it can exist until it's been approved by the finance committee without a deadline. Thank you, Chairman. And if we have served, if it's been um, based on the actual position, so we can base on the operation need year on year. And since uh, this uh, PEO post should, we can see that the need to be regularized. That's why we should count go to FC to get the endorsement, which I see as a long-lasting solution to operation needs. So this is more like an interim measure. So can I see it this way? So for the delegate authorities, so sh it will be based on the of, of frozen uh, positions instead of uh, make it out of thin air. Ms. Amalau? So uh, in line with the CSB, for any uh, frozen positions, we can actually um, uh, um, open some supernumerary positions based on delegate authority. I have one more question, so let's have a queue again. Next, Mr. James Toe. Thank you. So as a member of the legal community, I sympathize with the situation whether um, the judges have too little to do or the about the work of registrar. So as a government's paper, let's say um, an increase of various kind of workload. So can you, shouldn't some quantitative analysis to demonstrate the actual increase extent for the number of cases with particular categories and for any up uh, uh, free trial applications so um well so we still have the case management system or can you use um, I had to, in your memory, 
that um let's say um the extended increase in caseload I think it would be the need will be speaking for itself as for as for our as for how many register we need to cope with, with the how much increase in workload and for uh, you claim there are more complicated cases to another matter but at least and for the numbers at least you can make the case so can you provide such quantitative analysis Ms. Emma Lau in response to Mr. James Cho, so I would like to explain and since the deputy registrar in the high court, like the masters in the high court, besides dealing with the uh, hearing, the all the uh, uh, paperwork, as for the number of paperwork they dealt with is not being shown in our system. And in terms of their hearing load, well, we're not able to quantify that in our system. So, um, our case management system on offer deal provide as a total figure of cases which have been provided, or the number of cases entering trial, and for the short hearings or mainly paperwork that not able to provide an accurate snapshot through the system. And the caseload at the high court had been consist at a high number, and but also getting more complicated for each case, <coughs> which is quite difficult to quantify. And for this exception proposal of deputy registrar, beside the workload, I would like to highlight a few areas because recently we have introduced more uh, practice directions so it's not had to do with the uh, quantity of cases as for case management we have allocated three extra staff through internal retirement or interim appointment and for civil appeals criminal appeals and criminal listing we have allocated additional manpower to deal with the judges on listing and for a uh, subpoenaing and, and hearing we have uh, strengthened that so there are a new type of work so we not only quantify the cases and we also have new work functions and workflow which required additional manpower this so explain that for the past four to five years we only have 11 people in the establishment however we have been uh, deploying 16 in total thank you chairman as well we have a lot of a uh, short hearing because we have to allocate time for the councils and a lot in your paper however without quantitative analysis well, based on the information at hand, can you extract such information as requested by me? Well, as stated in your paper, you well in Perry you claim, well, um, you have uh, more of everything, so to speak. Well, it's really um taking your word for it, or if, for those with actual court experience. Let's say sending a clerk uh, to list for a short hearing. And then the date is quite uh, far advanced just for a few, for a few minutes. Two. So I hope that after this meeting, that you can give me some basic information concerning this. Now, don't get too complicated. Now, um, would 14 or 15 staff be enough, or you in reality, in reality need um, 18? But um, you may think that, well, because of the limited resources that are available, you will just be satisfied with um, the number of 16. So um, we need some more information like that. Yes, I'll go back and look at it. 
Oh, for big figures, we will have them. So I'll go back and see what can be provided to you. Now, for those uh, three minutes, 15 minutes hearings, uh, we know the numbers. And for case management, you know what I'm talking about. You want to be proactive. So suddenly you may notice something or the two parties argue, then you have to um, conduct a hearing. Then um, you don't, by doing so, you won't waste the judge's time. Then you can tell me that the workload in this area has significantly increased. Yes, I'll go back and dig up the relevant information. Okay, next question. I'll be asking the question. I would like to ask the JA for deputy registrars. What are their professional requirements? Are they um, lawyers? Must they uh, be graduates of law schools? Well, for DRs, they are um, judicial officers. As for the admission criteria, they are the same as uh, judges of district courts, and their ranks are also the same as district court judges. Now, for the judiciary, we have a recruitment policy. When we hire district court judges, well, other than acting as district court judges, they can also be deployed to the master's office of the high court and act as deputy registrars. So they are judicial officers and they are professionals. And also, they are hired through open recruitments. And also there is a cross posting arrangement with district courts. They can be deployed to the master's office of the high court. So sometimes uh, we would hear that judges are not busy. Well, well, the judges are very busy and I've heard uh, that's why you have increased the uh, uh, pace. Um, from 2018, we started a new round of recruitment for high court um, judges. We are now doing the recruitment, and by the end of 2018, we started to recruit district court judges. We hope that we can get the support of LACHCO so that we can create this four extra posts. Then for this round of recruitment, we will have more vacancies. Well, every time when we recruit judges, it will take time and resources. So we will uh, do it at appropriate times. By adding these posts, we hope that um, the manpower of our um, judge can be enhanced. Well, for the public, um, judges are to make rulings and judgments. So for the, these uh, deputy registrars, how do they assist in cases? Would they enhance uh, the efficiency of the courts? Can you explain to the public in simple terms? Now, when it comes to the high courts, there are many, many uh, civil cases. So from the issue of a civil action until it is ready for trial by a HC judge, there are many procedures, um, including interlocutory applications. So we will have to look at the case, and then um, different things would have to be done. So the two parties would have to exchange documents, and uh, uh, it has um, to be monitored as to whether uh, each party is well prepared. So before um, it is ready for trial by a judge, the DRs will be responsible for doing for doing all the jobs. And after a case is ruled, there are still things to be done. For example, um, taxation of costs and enforcement of judgments. So all these are handled by masters. As for the master system, it is very important and it's essential because um, they are to make sure that cases are managed smoothly. 
Now, not all the cases would um, go for trial before a judge. In the course of handling such cases, there may be uh, mediations and agreements. So for this master system, it is a time-honored system, and the whole civil action uh, procedures would be more smooth. I have to um, announce my three interests. I think um, there are interests um, about other members as well. You know, for all the um, candidates of an election, um, after an election, each uh, for each vote, we can get a fourteen dollars subsidy from the government. But there are a lot of um, electoral petitions, and now we are two and a half years after the last election, and we still cannot get this subsidy. It is because of um, the hiccups during the proceedings. So, um, can you tell us why that is the case? I think all members here have been affected. Many members have been affected. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, for individual cases, I'm sorry that um, I'm not in the position to answer them now. But this is what I can say. Now, for the judiciary, we have our um, Chief Justice. We will try our best to do things within our limited resources. We will try to handle um, the cases as soon as possible. Well, some cases may not be handled swiftly. Well, there are many factors. Uh, some factors may be about the court, some may be outside the court. Well, for the deputy registrars, would you remind them, well, that they should um, tell the uh, parties that uh, time is almost up. But would you consider uh, giving up um, your litigations? When it comes to judge um, case management, the DRs would refer to the practice directions, and they would deal with different cases accordingly. Well, for different cases, there are different uh, practice directions, and there are different ways of doing things. Thank you, Mr. Alvin Young. Well, we have always been supportive of the work of the judiciary. I would like the JA to help answer these questions. That is about paragraph 5. Now, for civil jurisdictional limits, it will increase the workload of the district courts. But now you're only applying um, to create posts in the high courts. Well, the establishment of the high courts will be enhanced. And in the long run, I think that the high courts workload will be less. So can you tell me about your logic? Thank you for Mr. Young's question. In 2013, well, due to the increases in workloads in different areas. Now, um, for our establishment, we have 11 posts, but um, we have actually deployed 16 uh, people to work at the master's office. And now we are applying for the creation of four posts. Why don't we apply for five posts? We, because we have taken uh, Mr. Young's question into account. Because well, for district courts, um, their civil jurisdictional limit was increased, and it was um, increased to three million last year. After that, we believe that about ten percent of the uh, master's office work will be. Um, transferred to district courts. So district courts will have a heavier workload. And if other factors do not change, the high court's workload may be lowered. So to be prudent, we have looked at our uh, present establishment. So that's why we are only applying for the creation of five, of four posts instead of five posts. Thank you. No follow-up. 
Any other members would like to ask questions? Mr. Adichie, first round, followed by Mr. Onokhin. Thank you, Chairman. I would like to ask a question about paragraph 9A. And you say that um, there will be two mega court building projects. And you will be looking at the user requirements and strategic planning. So what are these exactly? And for internal and external card users, do you mean that people from outside can also be engaged? J.A., with regard to Mr. G's question, now for the planning of uh, court buildings, well, because court buildings are very special buildings, we have to take care of its actual operations. So for internal court users, of course, they will include JJOs and all our staff. So it is not just an ordinary office building. There are court rooms and also um, there are different uh, needs in terms of operation. Ex and for external court users, they can be divided into two categories. Now for the first category, in court buildings, we also have officers from other government departments. For example, in each court building, because there are criminal cases and criminal cases may involve detainees. So we need to liaise with the correctional services department. Um, this department is also one of our court users. And also there is another very important sector, that is legal professionals. For solicitors and barristers, they are important legal representatives and they are our daily court users. Also, the press is also a court user. So no matter whether they are internal or external court users, we have to look at their needs. And how can we design the building um, so as to meet their needs? And we need a lot of strategic planning for that. Now there are many channels through which we conduct consultations under the judiciary, we have committees uh, for different court users. So through such committees, we can consult different stakeholders. So well, for the public in the gallery, they are also external court users. So um, to what extent can they be engaged? Well, for the um, public who are in the public gallery of uh, courts, well, are there new arrangements? Yes, every day uh, members of the public can um, come to courts to hear cases. So we already um, have a series of arrangements for them. And for the Court Users Consultative Committee, we have non-legal professionals to offer a uh, independent perspective. And, um, through, uh, and we also receive feedback and emails from time to time. Nothing further. Sure. I'll lock in. So I have two group of questions. And well, the proposed new positions is to uh, reform certain mechanisms. So I would like to know the details. And second, just um, asking for some specific information. And paragraph C, on the review of family procedure rules, and on um, paragraph 12, and 
on the final report on the review of family procedure rules. So these two are quite similar. So do you have a timetable for this two reviews and what's the progress so far and what's the direction they would take? Ms. Amalau. For Mr. Al's question, the review on family procedures rules have started a few years ago. And currently, the, fa the family rules are currently scattered across different procedure rules. So a few years ago, the Chief Justice have appointed a judge-led working group with the stakeholders to come up with a comprehensive review, which outlined a lot of recommendations on how to improve the of the of procedures and have it accepted by the Chief Justice. And the second part of the question, and for this recommendation, we need to uh, do some legislative exercise, which includes three parties. On one hand, we have to amend the principal legislation. And we need to review the subsidiary legislation so that this, all these procedures will, will not be scattered across different ordinance, but instead it, we are rationalized and uh, carved out an improved package. What we're doing at the moment that we are implementing the break them through a legal review. What well, we're currently amending these statutes in our timetable take reference with the our UK proceedings and the time required. We have planned for about six years. I think we had entered the second stage. So within the next few years we can consult the industry on a draft legislation, and upon the passage of all the uh, new legislation and procedure rules, and will also consult the relevant panel and LegCo before being tabled for LegCo for passage. So I got some time left. I'm trying to squeeze in one more question. So I would like to know, uh, with additional manpower, how do you deal with the backlog? According to the controlling officer report of 2018-19, you claim that uh, uh, for the uh, points to know before adding more manpower, we need to uh, monitor the waiting time at various court levels, especially on high court. Since the issue of this controlling officer report, have we conducted any monitoring, and can you provide us some figures, let's say, for the past three years, the waiting time for uh, each level of court, or do you have any uh, KPIs per se? Response to Mr. Al's question, we've been closely monitoring the waiting time. Indeed, uh, for any special need and where warranted, we will assign additional manpower. And um, while uh, things we have limitations, for example, we need to identify uh, suitable candidates to appoint as temporary judges. We are consolidating the 2018 figures, and very soon in the upcoming budget, the controlling officers report, we can uh, provide a more comprehensive picture to members. Any further questions? Next, Dr. K.K. Kwok. I generally agree with this proposal. My question comes in two parts. And for the deputy registrar, they usually take care of the administrative matters 
from court cases. We know there's a shortage of judges at various court levels. Is it possible to appoint non-judicial officers, let's say for those from other administrative grades, um, to assume this position so that uh, more judges will, with more judicial experience to deal with the backlog? For if the proposal is passed, how much improvement do you see in the backlog? Let's say in the magistracy and district court and high courts, how much waiting time can be shortened when waiting for the first hearing? And for the proposed creation of the principal executive officer, on the same time you're uh, keeping the supernumerary position, we see the a difference in uh, For example, the PEO, we need to do with a lot of uh, construction work, uh, and know that this uh, construction work will end eventually. Let's say the redevelopment of the high court, or you see redevelopment of the. Uh, in Cosway Bay, and upon the completion of the expansion and the redevelopment projects, would there be less need for this position, and would it be a supernumerary post, or and to better serve this time limited task? Maybe you can answer this question first. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, let me explain. And this deputy registrar are uh, judicial officers. Their actual requirements and qualifications are the same as uh, district court judges. So they're not fulfilling uh, administrative work, but judicial ones. And court and, and rules and, uh, and they need to be carried out by judicial officers. So they must be assumed by judicial officers instead of being replaced in with administrative grade. And with the creation of this new post, we must correspondingly um, add uh, more administrative support in carrying out their duties. So we will add more manpower uh, correspondingly. However, uh, it is required that um, the they be judicial officers for these chief main positions and for the waiting time. And currently, the Master's Office of High Court, we have an establishment for 11 of those, but now we have 16 colleagues. So, um, I say, um, and these we are so these are staff already working. It's just uh, turning some of the temporary judicial officer um, to begin their actual appointment and to our establishment and for the uh, 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 lasting impact. I believe there should be a positive. After creating his actual post, uh, well, I explained earlier that our existing policy while hiring the district court judges, this positions can also be considered a policy that uh, we will deploy district court judges to uh, appoint them as deputy registrars. If we have more positions, we can uh, make uh, more actual hires. And, uh, and we have more uh, members in the deputy stretch that will be beneficial to, uh, to the accumulation experience. So you said that we improved the morale from a temporary appointment to actual appointment. Well, these are uh, uh, temporary appointments. They don't see the uh, uh, continuity and not be sustainable, especially uh, these temporary appointments cannot unserved for a long periods of time. 
Well, it's, it's better that if they become permanent post. Would you like to ask them a third question or wait for the next round? Well, just answer briefly. Well, this uh, PEO is not only handle project work and the judiciary. Besides um, projects, we have already routine work to ensure that our court proceedings smoothly and um, provide an enhanced court user experience. I uh, can explain this members that uh, this is a very routine work and the two projects mentioned is just uh, really part of the uh, scope. Mr. Ray Chan, second round. And so the and enclosure one uh, it outlined the duties and responsibility of the deputy registrar. On for 1G, it was about taxing bills of cost. Can you um, explain what uh, what does it entail? Are you setting a criteria of cost bill determination or based on a basic experience to assess the cost in each case? As for uh, ch uh, chasing uh, uh, bills of cost and default, would it be handled by this post? Or otherwise, uh, who is responsible? And provide a general picture on the uh, court cost default and some of the uh, mainlanders uh, make a scene at the court and being uh, sentenced and we need to pay the cost and be repatriated to mainland and yet they're not required to pay the bill before they return to mainland. So Sam, the public are concerned how are you able to uh, pursue this? Does that mean that you should not be allowed to Hong Kong or unless they have uh, paid back the bill first? Can you? I would take this opportunity to explain this. That not all cases required the master's attention and for majority of cases, when both sides have already agreed on the bill of cost, they wouldn't come to the court. And where it has some cases, and, um, both sides will have uh, see differences on the determination of the um, cost, and if any dispute, they will come to the master's office. And since um, the amount involved vary, and for some major cases, what well, we're talking about are very uh, legal issues. So when the masters would deal with the uh, tax bill applications, taxation of costs, when both sides could not come to agreement, and where there are dispute and of a complex nature, when it, it comes to the master's attention. Besides, we deal with the uh, paperwork, and uh, sometimes we need to convene a hearing. And for the problem cited by uh, Mr. Chen, uh, this is far beyond my scope of work. I'm afraid not able to answer. I suppose um, it'll be better answered by the responsible government department. Mr. Ono Hin, second round. I would like to understand more about another mechanism. Well, at the last uh, budget, I also asked similar questions. From 2018 to 2019, I uh, read about this um, controlling officer's report. You said that the judiciary is now reviewing the waiting times uh, for certain cases. And now under 4B, you have talked about a practice directions um, on criminal listing. So a new uh, method for listing will be used. So while you are creating these posts, Does it mean that the waiting time uh, will be shortened? 
will there be indicate new indicators? JA. In this regard, we are still um, collecting information. We haven't set up a goal yet. We hope that within 2019 we can f complete this work. Well, for the cases you mentioned, the number is not high. We have to be prudent. We hope that we can accumulate more experiences and then we will do some analysis. Before we set our goals, we also need to consult the stakeholders and court users. And then we will um, finalize after taking all this into consideration. I would also like to get some more information from the government. For paragraph paragraph five, you say that some of the civil cases from the high court um, can be diverted to um, district courts. When I look at our last uh, our past logical paper, it says that there are three major types of data. Now, for um, different levels, of course, the, um, we have the number of cases here, and also we have the number of uh, interlocutory applications, and also um, the number of cases that have been diverted to a court of lower level. And here you also have a projected number of um, cases for different levels of course. So can we use this mechanism? Can you give us more information um, concerning this? We need I need the figures. And I need another group of figures. For the judiciary, I also asked this questions at the finance committee meeting. They said that I should ask you. Now, have you? Do you have the f uh, figures concerning complaints against judges in the past five years? Um, I hope these figures can be provided to me in writing after the meeting. For your first question, I would like to thank the member for putting forward that document. I also remember that document. We were. Um, doing projections at that time, um, that is, the district court's uh, limits be increased to three million. So for interlocutory cases, um, is a dozen percent. Yes, you are right. So when we create um, the post, why do we need? For, well, actually, we need five extra officers, but now we are creating only for new posts because we expect that about 10% of the workload will be transferred to the district district court. This is one of our considerations. And for the f past five years, the number of complaints against um, judges, yes, we do have that and we can provide that to you. Members, do you have any other questions? Dr. K.K. Kwok? I think many members of the public think that the transparency of the costs are not too high. For example, the uh, length of waiting time. And uh, the uh, waiting for hearing, etc. So um, all this are not transparent. Now with strengthened manpower, can you make things more transparent? Can you let the public know more about the waiting times? And also uh, for file numbers that they need. I think um, members also yearn for that. Um, now many government departments would tell members of the public how long the waiting time would be. Now they are f well, for ordinary members of the public, they may be uh, 
scared by cause, and if there are a lot of unknowns, it's even more scary. So can you make such a promise? After um, injecting more resources into the judiciary, can you help members of the public more? Because they have to go through very difficult legal procedures. Can more support be provided to them? Are there staff in the at courts where uh, who can help the public? I've heard a lot of complaints from the public. When they face a court, they really don't know what to do. It is a very difficult obstacle. So can you give us some reassurance, J.A.? Well, the courts have to deal with different types of cases. So for our waiting time indicator in our annual reports as well as uh, our controlling officers' reports, we have um, also touched on that. And if a person is involved in litigation, now we are doing this. Now if that person has a legal representative, then the legal representative uh, will be able to get information from the court, and the legal representative can also explain to um, the member of the public. But we understand that some people do not have legal uh, representation. So if they already have a file number concerning their case, then for different procedures, they can cite the file number. They can call the court or they can write to the court for inquiry because each case would have its own details. Now, we have been doing things this way. Our staff would help the masters and judges, and they would receive inquiries all the time. When they receive inquiries, they would work in accordance with uh, the rules and mechanisms under the law, and also they would seek the advice of the church, and they would reply to such inquiries. Well, can the, um, those information become more transparent? Yeah, you say that we can call to ask, but we all have this experience. That is. If you call a government department, the call would have to uh, be transferred many times before you can get an answer. Maybe you can take reference from other government departments, um, such as the transport department and the immigration department. If you can tell them what service you need, then they can uh, make things more transparent. Uh, for example, you tell them the you uh, you tell them your file number, and then they can tell you um, you may have to wait for six months or nine months. But for the judiciary, I don't think by a by reading your annual reports we would know what our situation is because in your report you only give us the average numbers, so it's not helpful to them. So I hope that you uh, can make things more user friendly for. Um, the general public uh, court proceedings are very difficult for them. For example, you can have a web page. Now, if they uh, log onto that web page and if they can provide their file number, then they can get the relevant information. They don't have to make 10 phone calls or wait for one month before they can get an answer. J.A. Now, for the judiciary uh, website, if you have a case file number, then you can input your number there and you can see some basic information. But I would like to stress this. Litigation mostly involves two parties. And when the court handle litigations, there are many procedures. They don't just talk to one party. Both parties have to be involved. 
So when it comes to different procedures, different state uh, stages, it may not only involve one party. So we will have to look at the interests of both parties or even uh, many parties. So um, we need to get the consent of uh, all parties before coming back to the court. Well, for making court information more public and making it more user friendly, yes, we agree that should be our directions. As for the um, court's work, we will try our best to optimize it. When it comes to inquiries concerning cases, we will continue to make improvements. For listing and other special circumstances, I would like to tell members that we really need to um, take all factors into consideration. Dr. Kwok, uh, your time is out. Some other people are waiting. Um, Mr. Wu I have two simple questions. Now for courts, I don't know whether I'm right. It seems that to me that's not all the um, judgment documents are uploaded onto your website. We will need the backgrounds and rationales for the judgments. Is that the case? Well, for some cases, uh, no matter for what reason the judgments are not um, put onto your website. Is that true? And if you have more manpower, would you make improvement in this area? Because I think um, the general public would like to read the judgments. And this would be much simpler. They don't have to go through other complicated procedures before they can read the judgments. And uh, sometimes, uh, if a person would like to start a litigation, he would have to go to the court and fill in forms, but he doesn't receive any assistance. So, when you fill in the form, you may be very lost. So, can the courts help the general public? This are uh, well, for simple uh, procedures, if you give them assistance, then the um, public can do things themselves, and then that would also save your manpower. Well, for our policies, for all the district courts and the um, courts about that above that level, all the uh, judgments in writing will be uploaded onto our website. Uh, we are now applying for the creation of this four posts. They have nothing to do with judgments. They are mainly to uh, tackle the uh, work concerning litigation in the master's office. Well, for district courts, we understand that there are uh, many defendants without legal representation under our present system the small claims uh, tri in the small claims tribunals uh, people are not allowed to have legal representations but the judiciary is an independent um, institution which um, conducts trials so uh, for our assistance to the public um, they are mainly about procedures and order to maintain the a neutral position and role of a um, independent judiciary. They're not in, po in a position to help the litigants to help them launch their proceedings. For example, uh, filling out their application in a high court. Uh, we have a, a resource center for unrepresented litigants, and in a small claims tribunal. We also have a uh, resource center 
to helping the litig uh, litigants. We have staff there to answer questions, and we also have some uh, application templates, so that we could provide assistance on an objective basis. If the litigants do require actual assistance in filling out the forms or to seek legal advice, I know that the administration in the district court, they have set up a resource center to help the unrepresented litigants. Well, uh, we discussed that on the HLSP panel that the judiciary uh, took a neutral role on this and f to provide the assistance to the litigants uh, to their cases, the administration or even the professional volunteer organizations will be more suitable. Um, Chairperson, uh, let me clarify. I'm not expecting the judiciary to help uh, with the actual cases and for any procedure inquiries, I suppose there be more, should be more detailed explanation. If the judiciary is not in position to do so, I hope that the administration to offer assistance because um, legal proceedings are very complex. Uh, they could um, uh, probate, land tribunal, so all kind of cases. I think we need to enhance the support so that uh, the public could at least know more about the proceedings. Well, um, I shall save for the next round. And uh, for putting the written judgment online, we have a lot of cases have to related to with a lands tribunal related to building management. However, it's not uh, easy to locate the relevant judgment. And first, how under what circumstances will they have a written judgment? And at various court levels, ever uh, do they do require to put their judgments online? Third round. Dr. Kwok, um, not raising question. Before we refer to the FC, I think the judiciary could set some clear objective, as quoted by Emma Lau. So let's say in the foreseeable future, within one to three years, said so when the public uh, uh, come in and challenges obtaining information. And how can uh, this funding proposal help improve the situation? And what uh, procedure improvements should we expect? I think that the, the courts would hope that for the unrepresented litigants, and when decide to law, uh, take legal action, and hope that they can do so in a friendly environment. I think that was what Hong Kong attached your importance to. I hope you can provide some information paper before uh, it's submitted to the FC. If you can't do it now, so maybe um, the and you can set up the, uh, the goals for the next few years, especially for information transparency and on the uh, Proceedings of cases. Administrator. The question raised by the members, I'm happy to provide answers. So allow me to talk briefly. The judiciary. We have been building consolidated case management system. And we also. Uh, Amending the legislation, I believe that with the new system in place to allow the applicants in making inquiry and so on electronically, which they will allow uh, for instant improvement. I've been happy to list them out in detail in the supplementary paper. I'm just waiting for the paper. Dr. Lowei Kwok. Chairperson, 
I support this proposal in principle. Um, earlier, um, members asked question on the rising workload. Is there any uh, quantifiable statistics? So I would like to get the picture from another perspective. Besides your workload, the civil service establishment would also examine the job effectiveness and the CIA civil service usually have the job appraisal for the judiciary uh, what's the situation like since I don't know much about for example those in the magistracy is quite quantify the workload you simply cannot decide it by the sole, solely by the number of cases so how do you carry appraisal to, to ensure there's a reasonable uh, balance between the establishment and the caseload. The judges and the judicial officers, their actual uh, work the distribution and appraisal is not handled by us, but mainly handled by the chief justice and the uh, court leader. Since there are the judicial officers and the Chief Justice and the co co Court Head will examine the workload distribution and the deployment. And to carry out follow-up accordingly, like Dr. Lowe said, for judicial work, we simply cannot uh, look at it from the quantitative perspective. Let's say the hearing could be one hour, could be 60 days, or even longer. So if we treat them as ca cases, they will not give a full picture. The head of each court level will regularly monitor the uh, judge's daily docket. and to make adjustment if necessary. If the workload is too heavy, the, um, the, not the such a redeploy some of the workload to allow for more time to write the judgment. And for some cases, maybe in a short notice, since uh, been settled out of court, and uh, while the scheduled dates have become available, and the court head will decide to arrange some uh, shorter cases or assigned to uh, paperwork. So it's very dynamic. I understand. However, the answer that was provided haven't quite asked the question. I'm sure that a lot of members of the public have this question as well, that f um, the public is quite concerned about the efficiency of a lot of appointments. And they've we felt it worked to me um, lambasted roundly for judiciary while well, some the parties may decide to hold appeal however uh, you cannot criticize the judge as making a mistake and let's go members we have to be very careful when making such line of criticism How to ensure judicial independence and impartialness, and at the same time, there are unreasonable deployment. It is very hard to give a clear answer. Well, in any case, do not affect my support for this proposal. But in the long run, how to make the public um, get to know more about this point of concern? I think what you raise is appropriate. Uh, what the administration had considered for quite a long time, while well, for judicial independence is rather related to the judgment, as for the use of public resources, 
do need to make accountable to let's go on the deployment and efficiency. That's uh, that, that the, the post of judicial administrator was set up by Governor Chris Patton. But I believe he received of complaints before I come to office, and and the first administrator, and it was at uh, Tai Yun Ying, and the work efficiency of the registrar being criticized. That's why we have appointed more judicial administrators. Well, this had not conflict with the judicial independence. I believe that um, Mace and the public concern is justified. When our deputy Administ director administration this post created, and Holden Chow, I support creation of this position. I believe that um, this, the workload is on the rise before um, the need for more staff is warranted. On Para 12, since yeah, um, we have a supernumerary post uh, for development office, and now they have to uh, final report on the review of the plan procedures rule on the re recommendations implementation. Well, this post is created for three years, and in respect to three years' time, they were able to conclude the work. And do you expect that in three years' time, we were able to uh, complete the substantive work on this? A second question. I know that the development office had a lot on the plate. Besides this, with this supernumerary post to prepare to check on other routine work. For example, in point B, on the ex right exchange with judiciaries of other jurisdictions, which I believe to read regularly as well. Well, uh, we anticipated that in a few years' time, we can finish legislating on the family procedure rules. We are in the drafting stage upon completion on the uh, bill and the procedure rules, which including the practice directions uh, can be uh, made for consultation for the sector. And after we can come to the panel and submit to let's go for vetting. Well, that's our goal that hopefully we can complete the exercise within three years. And for the work of development office, and thanks for Mr. Chow's question. Well, um, our workload is increasing. For the long-term manpower planning, we are currently having a review. So shortly after, when we come up with concrete proposals, I will um, made a briefing at the AGLSB. Next, Mr. Wichu, why second round? In my first round, well, I made an inquiry at the, at the end. I hope we'd have um, more time for the administration to explain. So, uh, if the case is that I'm not new at the district court level for any written judgment, I believe these are important reference. <laughs> Even though I haven't get to the district court state, it are imp useful information for the public to understand the court thinking when dealing with similar cases when it comes to interpretation of existing statutes which were able to help a lot of similar cases. I hope you can offer more detail, especially where the written judgment and what circumstances both the uh, judges have the right to make the arrangement to upload it online or not, or there's a written mechanism in, case, in place. 
when judges make judgments in the court, they might have already um, said a lot about the uh, grounds for making the judgments, but they may not be included in the written judgments. So for this kind of um, oral judgments, that is the reasons for the judgments. Um, is there a possibility to upload them onto the website as well? On behalf of the judiciary, I would like to respond to the members' questions. As I said just now, for the um, courts above the um, district courts, um, the judgments will be uploaded, and that would include the Lands Tribunal. Now, for district courts, those at the same level are uh, families court and lands tribunals. So, if they have written judgments, including the judgment itself and the rationale behind the judgments, all of these will be uploaded onto the websites of the judiciary. So, um, the written judgments of the lands tribunal will also be included. So, under what circumstances uh, would the court have written judgments, and under what circumstances that they would not have uh, written judgments? And how about the rationales? Would the judiciary put such records into a written form and upload it onto the website for the public? Well, for District Council, Family Courts, and Lands Tribunals, and the courts above that level, all their written judgments will be uploaded. As I said just now, there may be very short hearings, and they do not have written judgments. So um, those would not be uploaded. As long as there are written judgments, they will be uploaded. My question is like this: Yes, it may not. It may be a very simple judgment, but the judge might have said something. Uh, for example, the reasons why he made such a judgment. So, would that record be uploaded onto the website so that the public can make reference to that? That may just be a straightforward judgment. Now, because uh, the public may not know. Too much about the cost, and these can become very useful uh, reference for controversial uh, cases. Uh, most of them would have written judgment for very simple cases or interlocutory cases which are not very controversial, there may not be written judgments. So for most of the controversial uh, cases and above the level of the district court, um, there are judgments in writing. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? If members have no other questions, I shall put this item to the vote. Will those members in favor of the proposal raise their hands? All members are in favor of the proposal. Any objection? Anyone against the proposal? No. Or abstention? I declare that this item is passed. Do you think it should be voted on independently at the FC? No need. Okay, thank you. Next item. Next item. Proposed creation of three permanent posts of one administrative officer, staff grade C, AOSGC, in the new Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office, ETO, in Bangkok, with immediate effect upon approval of the Finance Committee to head the new Bangkok ETO. One AO staff grade B. D3 in the new Hong Kong ETO in Dubai with effect from the 1st of April 2019 or immediate effects upon approval of the FC, whichever is later. To head the new Dubai ETO and 1AOSGC D2 
in the new ETO Policy Division of the Commerce, Industry and Tourism Branch of the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau with immediate effects upon approval of the FC to head the new ETO Policy Division. On the 17th of um, July, the CI panel of the LACHCO has discussed this. And we have several uh, government officials here with us. Ms. Eliza Lee, PS for Commerce and Economic Development, President Sam, Deputy Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development, and Ms. Connie Chung, PEO, Commerce, Industry and Tourism Branch. And Mr. Yu Siwing is the chairman of the CI panels. He's not here, so I will report on what they have said. Now, the CI panel in July discussed this on the 7th of July. And with regard to the territorial coverage of the new ETOs, they are mainly Asian cities. Members expressed concern as to whether the promotion of trade uh, is would be too lopsided towards Asia. And members are also members are very con concerned about the ETO and their policy departments. Um, what would they do in terms of the um, trade conflicts between uh, China and the USA? And they propose that the our external trading trading markets and network should be extended uh, the trade barriers should be minimized. And as Hong Kong has an independent uh, membership in the WTO, um, they should help to diversify um, the trading partners of Hong Kong. Um, we shouldn't rely too much on one market, etc. Mr. Chen Chen Ying, I would like to ask about paragraphs 19 and 20. That is the timetable, implementation timetable for the ETO. Um, at Bangkok, um, the uh, creation of the post will take effect upon the approval of the FC. But for the Dubai ETO, you are saying that our progress as well. But sometimes um, the time concerning uh, doing this is out of control. And now you say that um, the Dubai ETO will be created with the effect on the 1st of April 2019 or with immediate effect upon approval of the FC. So even if the FC approves it, it may still take some time to create the Dubai ETO. So why don't you say that it's with immediate effect upon the approval of the EC or when um, everything is ready, whichever is later? Now, if you talk to the host um, country, the policy department would have to um, handle that. So upon the approval of the FC, the uh, policy department uh, staff will take care of that. So there may be a time gap. And, and under paragraph 14, you talk about these two ETOs. I think they are like other two uh, other ETOs, the uh, structures are the same. So uh, would the establishment be completely the same? Well, for different countries, um, they have the different situations. So would you have to look at um, the actual situations? Because for um, UAE and Thailand, they are very different countries. And for paragraph 31, they are the setup costs of the officers and the um, annual expenditure. So for UAE, I think I think um, is economic situation, living standard is very are very different from those of Bangkok. So, can you tell us about the one of setting up expenditures and regular expenses? Miss Lee, there are three questions. First. Um, concerning the implementation timetable. Now, for these two ETOs, that is a Bangkok ETO and Dubai ETO, well, for uh, Bangkok's work now is near completion, and for the Thai company, um, well, the Thai um, government uh, 
procedures are almost completed. So we uh, hope that uh, by the first quarter of this year, the uh, office can be established. As for Dubai, we are talking with the UAE government and also the discussion work is near completion. We have the confidence that within the first quarter, that is before the 1st of April, the relevant work can be completed and then we will start um, doing the preparatory work, uh, and then we will look for uh, an appropriate location. We will identify uh, the candidates, etc. So the the director's post of um, Dubai ETO can start on the first of April. As for the third question, it's about the expenses for um, setting up and operating the ETOs. Now for the expenditure, um, there are two parts. One is about manpower and the member also asked about the establishments of the ETOs. Now we will have five new ETOs. They may not have the same manpower structure, but for um, Dubai and Bangkok, well, Hong Kong will send five officers there. We will have one directorate and four non-directorate staff. And then there will be 12 um, employees hired from the host country. So these two ETOs are the same. That's why the um, expenditure on manpower um, are the same. And also, for these two ETOs, the scales are more or less the same. So the annual expenditure is um, $29 million. We will also have to uh, look for offices and um, do renovation work, and that would be about $10 million for each ETO. Mr. Wu Chuai, thank you. We have many ETOs overseas in different parts of the world. I remember at the CI panel, we had a detailed discussion about this. For our ETOs overseas, well, how do we assess their work? Well, they uh, should be marketing for Hong Kong, and they should also be bringing our businessmen overseas so that more businesses can be done. So they have their functions and their performances should be made clear to us. So I have these questions. I remember I argued with uh, Mr. Edward Yao. He said that it's very difficult to um, quantify the performance of ETOs, but I think this is unreasonable. I have looked at other countries' uh, attitudes. When there are officers representing the countries, they attach a lot of importance to the performances. And then they would have a comprehensive policy as to where to set up their representative offices so that they can bring their businesses overseas and also um, attract overseas investments. Now you have these two new ETOs. So can you tell me what the strategic goals are? How can you appraise the performances? Are there indicators? So in the how would they promote our tradings? Is that well, um, they could have been solved by consolidating the ETO networks. And all the effectiveness of the various ETOs and 
uh, subject to the economic performance of the host countries would the administration consider consolidating. We have three in America, one in Toronto, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. And shouldn't it be a certain consolidation of the three offices that we relate to the overall strategy? But have the government ever considered this so that um, our ETO will be st placed strategically in locations of a, a, a more trade potential instead of setting up and let it be. Especially when the economy mature, uh, uh, well, I wonder if the administration will consider consolidating the ETOs in the region so as to appraise their effectiveness and performance. I think Mr. Wu had a good question. So, what kind of strategic thinking do you have in mind? Why Dubai, Bangkok? What are the other plans? Well, Hong Kong have a total of 12 ETOs, which uh, covered our biggest 20 trading partners. And for the strategic de deployment, the 20 largest trading partners, they're of course, they're critical to our economy. So we must maintain our existing network. In terms of our strategic development, we want to look further in other trading partners where there will be potential to enhance the uh, bilateral trade relations with more opportunity opportunities to promote inward investment. Well, actually, we know. So uh, this is what I want to know about the strategy. So with um, exploring various emerging markets, we have identified five locations. Well, unlike the Mr. Wu's understanding or from uh, the ASC understanding, that's like that. We consider the Middle East, India. We have a huge market there. We'll see there's a huge potential to uh, boosting our linkage to ASEAN. South Korea is a very important market to us as well. And also Russia. So. Uh, so based on their future potential, we hope that we can expand the ETO network to these new emerging markets. For the existing ETOs, that the first one, if the chairman still remember, is uh, 1945. For the past 10 years, we're only at two new ones. Well, at, at Berlin in 2016, in Jakarta. Well, now that um, in one stroke, well, uh, well, in the context of a U.S. Sino trade dispute, we need to uh, help our enterprise go global to tap into new markets. That's why we identified these five locations for new ETOs. So through the establishment, we can help the companies go global as well to bring in with investment. So that will be our uh, strategic plan. So can I answer the question in KPI? Well, ran out of time. Well, a bit later because I waited for my turn. Just kidding, Mr. Holden Chow. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, commend the Washington D.C. Uh, ETO while in my visit to the Washington D.C. and the ETO there had provided a lot of useful information on the uh, bilateral ties between Hong Kong and U.S. and also some practical information, so I'll, I'll show appreciation for them. On setting up more ETOs, okay, let's start with Bangkok. Well, since uh, Thailand is considered one of the leaders in the ASEAN bloc, so in ASEAN, besides the Singapore and Indonesia, I believe that the Bangkok is the logical choice for the third one. So I will support this.
for Dubai ETO, I have a question there. I see for Paris 7, and you claim that you see huge development potential of Islamic finance. They will help promote development of Hong Kong Islamic bond market. Speaking of Islamic finance, and back in the Donald Trump administration that have been uh, promoted if they have been mentioned back then so so many years on we have to wait so long for the Dubai Egypt to establish so what transpired during this time For Islamic bond market, I believe that the MSTB bet position as said, I think they have quite a few experience in launching Islamic bonds. Miss Eliza Lee, like I said earlier, we only have opened two ETOs in the past decade. It was a 2009 Berlin and 2016 in uh, Jakarta. Well, we uh, seriously study any potential markets, and for one, I think the Middle East countries carry great promise. While they're along the Belt and Road initiatives and finance, logistics, and advanced manufacturing, they have a lot of opportunities there. In particular. The UAE is also very important, and yet the coverage of the Dubai ETA will cover the entire Gulf Cooperation Council, which includes UAE, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Amman, Kuwait. And since they have such a huge region, in the preparation, we uh, look identified Dubai as the center point. Like I said, we handle all the member states of the GCC to promote Hong Kong. Well, um, we have a slight delay, but but ho hopefully, uh, in the latest batch of uh, uh, ETO, we can include Dubai as well. My turn now. I fully support creating more overseas ETOs. Like the Prime Secretary said, well, we have only have 12 ETOs so far. Compared to Trade Development Council, we have much less. They have like 60 or 70. I need to take a look it up. Well, they have a lot more. Well, even South America, Africa, and so on. Um, allow me correction. 50. The actual figure. So even with those two new ones, uh, 14 in total for us. The Prime Secretary claims that um, the negotiations pretty much uh, interface had to do with the privileges immunity. So I think they said at various levels some countries treat us better, and Australia actually passed the legislation for the Hong Kong ETO. So I wonder, can you make public? Let's say for the ETO, for the Dubai ETO, and what's it? Can you make a, a comparison with the Bangkok? ETO. Would you like to provide information or after lunch? I just want to know uh, what kind of privileges immunity are able to obtain from the UAE government. And I see that uh, the grading of the office is different. One is a D2, one is D3. Is that because we have two ETO in ASEAN? So the biggest one is in Jakarta. When looking at the uh, grading of the ETO head, we need to also need to consider the coverage of the ETOs, the duties of the head, and comparison with other ETOs, and the level interaction of the ETO on head of the daily basis. In the ASEAN, we already have two ETOs, and the Jakarta ETO that the coverage will be the 10, well, 4 out of 
10 Asian countries, which is, and also take on charge the overall bilateral relations with ASEAN. The head of Jakarta is a, um, a D3. Uh, and the Singapore responsible for the six remaining ASEAN countries. The ASEAN one is a, the head is a D2. And the new Bangkok ETO will, will add, uh, take out three ASEAN countries for, for Bangkok. When overall speaking, that the comp uh, will pitch the Singapore ETO and Bangkok ETO at the same level, and while they will report to the Jakarta ETO, which is headed at a D3. And the question asked about uh, what's the picture like for Dubai ETO, and since the coverage of Dubai cover. A range of countries of Bahrain, Kuwait, Amman, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, and so on. And currently, we have no ETOs covering them. So the head of the ETO must start from scratch to develop relationships with the political and business sector. And suppose um, they'll expect to be a very high level uh, interaction. And for the Dubai ETO, we do need to have someone with more experience. So we suggested for Dubai ETO that the head would be pitched at D3. I suppose that you set up ETO in India. Well, do you have enough? those from the AO grade or you, know, you uh, consider external equipment or you provide language training for Middle East you need to provide Arabic training. I think there's a note that Singapore actually sent their uh, administrative officer to the Middle East to study for Islamic culture and language. Otherwise you can't develop relationships. I see that your inquiry very appropriate. Uh, we'll uh, s we'll s uh, select a bureaucrat to handle that, and all along has been administrative officer grade, and this shall continue. And if the host country are not English speaking, well, it fre of for, for, for example in Brussels, or sometimes Geneva, well, there a more opportunity to use French. Well, I think some of the officers are pretty well versed in French. And the CSB will actually provide training on these foreign languages. And all, so, some, a lot of the uh, uh, civil servants have received a lot of language training. If they haven't uh, been um, grasping the language before they're posting, they'll be on the job training as well. I think that those dispatched to the Middle East should learn about Arabic culture and language. Next, Mr. Yushi Wing. Well, for the ETO, it was about trade related. Well, I see that it will enhance the recognition of Hong Kong globally. I think they will also have a role to promote Hong Kong tourism. So this time you are opening ETOs at Bangkok and Dubai. And for uh, Bangkok ETO, it will also look after Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. And for the Dubai ETO, it will be taking care of the member states of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, these are places where the um, tourism uh, board uh, doesn't have a representative office. So I'd like to ask the government. Now for these two new ETOs, because they will cover a number of countries, and in these countries, um, Hong Kong's tourism board doesn't have representative offices. So 
Would these ETOs also help to promote Hong Kong? Uh, because for um, the uh, ratio of overseas uh, tourists in Hong Kong now is still on a low side. So uh, would they um, try to enhance the number of visitors coming to Hong Kong? And when it comes to visa arrangements, can you also explore uh, the opportunities of uh, simplifying the visa application visa application procedures for these countries? Thank you. Uh, for ETOs, well, they are the official representative of the Hong Kong government overseas. For ETOs in different places, they are mainly focusing on the economic and trading relationships as well as cultural relationships between between Hong Kong and the host countries. And one very important function of the ETO is to promote Hong Kong's unique position and uh, advantages under the one country, two systems. So ETOs would also be uh, supporting um, the Hong Kong government's initiatives overseas. So uh, promoting tourism is also very important. And also uh, they would promote um, innovation and technology as well as arbitration service. The ETOs would help the different Hong Kong government departments. And that would include the Tourism Board of Hong Kong. Now, ETO is a promoter, and it would promote for different Hong Kong government departments. They will do uh, different areas of work, and the relevant Hong Kong. Um, government department will be the initiator. Yes, I understand. Well, for the uh, Bangkok and Dubai ETOs, they are in a country where the Hong Kong Tourism Board doesn't have a re representative office. Well, that's no problem if the Tourism Board already has an office there, but they are in areas where we do not have a tourism office. Now, some um, countries are developing, developing very rapidly economically, and they can provide us with a lot of visitors. So for these two ETOs, would they do more follow-up work in these areas and make recommendations so that they can attract more tourists to come to Hong Kong? Well, for ASEAN countries, the um, tourism board may not have a representative office. And as far as I know, the tourism board attaches a lot of importance to the ASEAN market. So um, the tourism board may have its own plans, or it may join hands with our ETOs to do, to do promotions. So with the establishment of the um, Bangkok ETO, I'm sure um, this will be a very important task. Dr. K.K. Kwok. Well, um, I do not object to the creation of these two posts. Well, sometimes it dumps trillions of dollars into the sea uh, for reclamation for mirages. So now you are doing something concrete, so I think the one money is well spent. I have two questions. First, about priority. Well, for the Bangkok and Singapore ETOs, well, these two countries are members of the ASEAN. But for other countries, for example, India, why don't we set up an office there first? And how about Vietnam and Cambodia? Well, 
relatively, they may be more distant from us. And further away in Europe, in Italy, well, Italy is a major trading partner of Hong Kong. I'm not saying that you um, shouldn't build these new ETOs, but how about how about the priority? I think uh, Vietnam does have a huge potential. As for Hong Kong and Thailand, I think we already have a, a long-term relationship. Many Hong Kong people would visit Thailand and vice versa. But for the uh, countries I mentioned earlier, would the potential be even higher? Second, now after you establish these ETOs, I hope that there can be concrete improvements. So are there targets for these two ETOs? Would you have certain expectations that is after they are established? How much more in terms of trading volume can be increased and how many more visitors can be attracted? And how about fixed asset investment? Would that be indicators so that we know the exact figures? And maybe a few years down the road, um, the logical and the audit can uh, check all these. Just now, I have um, already said this in, t in the introduction. Now we have 12 ETOs. They cover our 20 top trading partners. Italy is now already covered. So with this term of government, uh, we are discussing with five governments, and we will set up five more ETOs. They include uh, the Bangkok ETO and the Dubai ETO, and we also have we will also have um, an ETO in Mumbai, another one in Moscow, Russia, and another one in Seoul, South Korea. So we will have to discuss with the relevant governments. In particular, the governments would have to give us certain uh, powers and exemptions. So all these works are being carried out at the same time. So you are now establishing these two ETOs because the governments have given you uh, their consent. Yes, but, uh, but we are discussing with the five governments at the same time. Our progresses are different. Now, for the Bangkok ETO, we have completed um, our negotiations. And for the internal uh, procedures, the Bangkok government has almost completed all of them. So now we are trying to uh, identify a place for our office. And for, for um, UAE, the discussion is near completion. We are now still discussing with the other three governments. And how about indicators for all the ETOs? And actually, this is also to answer Mr. Wu's question. For all the ETOs, we would look at three areas. Each year, um, in the controlling officer's reports, we will look at these three areas. That is uh, foreign trade, public education, and uh, foreign investments. So in the budget, this would be um, included. What indicators can you uh, state them again? Three, there are three. First is uh, foreign trade relationship. Second, public relation. Third, um, investment promotion. So these are the major uh, work areas of ETOs. In the uh, controlling officer's uh, budget report, such information are uh, provided every year. I'm asking about these two ETOs. They will use the same three indicators. So will you say that uh, within three to five years after the establishment, would you look at a certain level? Now for the third goal, that is about investment, do you have a um, target 
for example, how much uh, trading volume will be increased. Well, uh, these offices are not established yet. So when we uh, formulate the budget, we will uh, put the indicators in the relevant uh, documents. So we will have to wait for the budget uh, before we know the indicators. So we won't know by March. Well, as members uh, may know, as long as the budget is not announced, I cannot disclose the details. So there are three main indicators. We'll work in accordance with the three indicators. For the new ETOs, they would make a pledge in accordance with the indicators. We still have three members who would like to ask questions, and we only have four minutes left. I would lengthen the meeting by five minutes, and after Mr. Aldokin asks his questions, we will adjourn the meeting. Well, for this four minutes, I may say something that you would deem impolite. Now, for ETOs, even though they achieve the three goals, you uh, well, you say that they should achieve the three goals, but I'm very suspicious. Well, ten years ago, I was taken care of by the Tokyo ETO, but at um, that time, I think the uh, major officers there didn't speak Japanese. The government officials of Japan may not be fluent in English. So for our officers there, if they do not speak Japanese, there may be a big problem. And for the UK, if they send officers to Hong Kong, they would um, train them for one year um, in terms of language. They would ask them to learn Chinese before coming to Hong Kong. So how much training would you provide to your ETO officers? And you're talking about external relationship, um, public relations, and investment. Now, when the LACO members visited the UK, we talked about this. In Hong Kong, we have a lot of IT uh, policies, and we also have tax holidays for foreign investors. There are also uh, free trade agreements. So after Brexit, maybe we can build a closer relationship with the UK. Well, if you ask the uh, parliament members, it seems that many of them do not know about our policies. So what has the London ETO done? And second, you talk about public relation. Then I must uh, mention Washington ETO's performance when it comes to the um, U.S.-China trade war. Now, the um, U.S. Congress has issued a report, and it's said that um, Hong Kong's position should be reviewed, and a lot of businessmen are scared. Well, um, on the 14th November, the report was released. But what did ETO do? ETO was talking about the shoe industry. And then a few days later, they issued a press release on APEC. Although Edward Yao's uh, remarks on protectional protectionism was mentioned, but they didn't focus on the trade war. Now you will be establishing several new ETOs. I think there should be one better indicator. That is, um, they should focus on policies. Well, how many uh, people are experienced in international relationships? I just talked about Tong Tokyo, Washington, and London ETOs. I didn't see that they have done much to achieve your indicators. Um, uh, does Permanent Secretary, for the language question, from my understanding, let's say the Tokyo ETO staff well, um, uh, for quite a lot of uh, staff dispatched to Tokyo ETO are well versed in Japanese well, those are suitable to head each year or limited pool of candidates. Does that probably mean to have a lot of people to choose from? 
Well, sometimes we are given limited choices. And where the ETL require foreign language skills for the pool of available candidates, um, they will make sure they will have the relevant uh, foundation linguistic knowledge. Especially where our expanding our ETOs outside of English speaking countries, we be very careful. And for the value for money indicators, KPI, including the trade promotion indicators, the public relations and the trade indicators, if the members are closely at a controlling officer's report, there are a lot of the indicators are actual reflection of our work. I don't think that this indicators cannot give a picture of the results of the ETO. I declare the meeting adjourned. We'll continue next time. When's the next meeting? It'll be next Wednesday. Twenty third, rather. Thank you.